I will introduce Katrina with her talk and active learners, behaviour and neural mechanism. Hi, can everyone hear me? So, um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organizers to, uh, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, especially because several of the people who have um, inspired the research that I've been doing um, are in fact in this room. Uh, so I'm a former PhD student of Ted Liga, our host, and I will present a sort of a brief overview of the work that we've done here at Bergbeck together with Vicky Southgate. Uh, looking at social learning in infants and how it may be explained by um, their motivation to seek information. Um, and just to begin with, given that there was lots of talk about um, terminology and what is curiosity, what is interest and what is information seeking, I have to um, say that I will be guilty of using these terms interchangeably because um, given that there's little consensus in what we as adults think these terms mean, it's almost impossible to know what exactly we measure in infants, but I hope that um, our data will convince you that we are probably top tapping into some of the same mechanisms. Okay, so the idea of the child as an active learner driven by curiosity is probably as old as the field of developmental psychology itself. And uh, the young children's role in gathering information and generating evidence has been an enduring theme of research in both play and exploration in children but it has been, in fact, largely neglected in the field of social learning. But given that learning from people is one of the most prominent ways in which infants gather information in everyday <coughs> life, um, we thought that investiga investigating their active involvement in the process of social transmission of knowledge uh, seems of particular importance, and that's what our research aimed to do. So most theories on infant social learning and studies investigating it focus on infants' ability to learn the information that adults convey to them um, when the adults decide to teach them about whatever the adults decide to teach them. So it's the adults that guide the timing and the content of the teaching interactions. And there is indeed a vast amount of research that shows that infants are very well equipped to learn from adults. We know they, have, uh, they seem to have these biases that make them attend to people who are, for example, looking at them or speaking from directed speech. So markers of an intent to teach, and they make inferences that go beyond the communication, so they seem to be adapted and have with these cognitive biases that ensure this tr transmission of knowledge through communication is efficient. Um, however, in order to ensure the optimal transmission through, of uh, information through communication, both participants arguably should be actively involved. If the learner is able to take on an active role in gathering information and asking for information when, it, when it's needed about what is needed, then they'll need to passively rely on ch chance that this will be supplied. And a number of infant behaviours, for example, social referencing, so that's infants looking to people in ambiguous situations, babbling, infant pointing, infant selectivity in who they interact with, um, all of these behaviours have been suggested to potentially um, serve as um, behaviours that elicit and modulate the information that infants receive in a social context. Um, and for example, babbling and pointing um, have been shown to inf in fact correlate with learning. So the amount of babbling or pointing at one developmental stage is predictive of subsequent language outcomes. But this relationship has largely been interpreted as infant's behaviour, increasing the amount of information flow. So the more they babble, the more the adult interact with them, and the learning is just sort of incidental to this. But we think that it is plausible that uh, maybe this, um, responding to these behaviours facilitates infant's learning, potentially because they in fact signal some sort of interest or curiosity or heightened engagement with whatever they're interacting with, and it's in fact that that facilitates the learning in this context. So we aim to investigate this, because as we heard in all the talks so far, studies now have confirmed that um, states of curiosity and heightened interest can function as an intrinsic reward mechanism that directly modulates what information will be encoded. And while direct assessments of curiosity or interest are practically impossible in infants, um, some of their behaviours do appear to uh, be consistent with what would be predicted by theories of um, curiosity-driven learning. Uh, 
For example, even in the first year of life, infants allocate attention to stimuli with sort of the optimal balance between information gain and cognitive effort, and they guide their exploration towards closing gaps in their knowledge. And just like adults, they seem to, um, um, their learning seems to be boosted when they're in a state of uh, curiosity or surprise. Um, so these studies suggest that these rewarding mechanisms of information search and consumption may already be in place in infancy, and that like adults, infants' interest or motivation to learn um, can define what they will in fact learn in any moment. And given the, this effect that it might have on infants, um, that satisfying curiosity could have on infants' learning, and the fact that learning from others is probably the most prominent way of obtaining information, we aim to explore these um, relationships in social learning. So more specifically, we attempted to shed light on these beha potential behavioral expressions of interest in infants and how they affect their learning. And then we attempted to find neural markers of interest or this sort of heightened preparedness for learning, um, and then use these neural markers to explore other aspects of infant social learning. So the first of these potential um, information-seeking behaviors that we explored was uh, pointing. So uh, the aim of the first study we did was to establish whether infant pointing could serve as a way of them expressing interest and soliciting information from adults. And we reasoned that if infants' motivation to point is indeed to obtain information about the referent from the adult they're interacting with, then they should modulate how much they use this behavior according to the ability of the adult to, in fact, provide them with this information. So what we did was that we had a live interaction, we played with objects that were familiar to the infants, and the uh, adult playing with them was either um, labeling these objects correctly or mislabeling them, and <coughs> therefore establishing herself as either a good or a bad informant. And at the same time, novel objects were unexpectedly appearing from behind her. So if the infant wanted the experimenter to see the object and give them any information about it, they would have to point. So um, what we found was that infants indeed modulated the amount um, of pointing to the novel object according to the kind of person they were interacting with. So the infants who were interacting with the sort of normal, correctly labeling adult pointed substantially more than infants who were interacting with someone who clearly was not a good informant. So these results suggest that infants indeed use the gesture of pointing to obtain information, use it selectively, that is only when it can actually um, achieve the goal of obtaining information. Um, so if infants pointing truly does reflect interest or curiosity, um, then we should expect that responding to infants pointing should affect their learning, but we know that curiosity states affect learning in adults. So our next question was, do infants in fact learn the information they express interest in through pointing better than unsolicited information? So this is what we did with this study. Um, we offered infants two novel objects at the same time and um, waited for them to point to one of them. And once they have done so, we either demonstrated the function of the object they had pointed to or the function of the other object. So there are four pairs of objects and they got two uh, functions of the ones they pointed to and two of the ones they didn't. Um, and after all the demonstrations, in the break, infants got these objects, and what we observed is whether or not they correctly replicated any of the functions that we previously demonstrated. And what we found was that the amount of correctly replicated functions was higher for the objects they have pointed to than the ones they have not pointed to. But um, based on this, so this was a within subject design, uh, we couldn't really conclude. So we, we wanted to say that infants' learning was facilitated when information was given about the objects they pointed to, but we don't really know whether it was in fact this interest that drove the pointing that facilitated learning, or could it be that perhaps when we didn't respond to their pointing, their learning was in fact hindered. So we ran another study where we uh, compared these things between subjects. So it was one condition when all of their choices were responded to, and another condition where they had no choice, and we got, obtained the same result which indeed suggests that um, learning was facilitated when these um, expressions of interest were responded to with the requested information and not hindered when it was uh, not. 
Um, so one point for discussion here is that these results are in fact in conflict with the incidental learning uh, results that we heard of earlier in, in the workshop, uh, whereby infants seem to learn only the specific information about the object that they pointed to and not any information. So if you want to claim that pointing is a reflection of general interest or curiosity, then according to the adult studies, we might expect that they would learn anything given in that state, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so, based on the fact that infants modulate how much they use pointing behavior according to whether there is information um, to be gained, and that um, responding to these uh, um, gestures, in fact, affects what infants learn, uh, we can conclude that indeed this is one of the ways that infants actively modulate what information they receive, and that um, it's likely that these uh, gestures, in fact, reflect infant's interest or signals a sort of optimal state for learning. So our next question was, um, can we find some sort of neural correlate of this optimal state of learning or interest or curiosity or whatever you want to call it that we could use to explore what infant's expectations are, um, what different, um, different partners they want to learn from and so on. So, um, to do this, we turn to adult literature. And based on um, a body of research in adults, uh, like some of the studies that we have heard by Matthias Biro, um, we chose to look at theta oscillations. So in adults, we showed that um, expecting to receive information um, is associated with this um, oscillatory activity in the theta frequency band in anticipation of actually receiving information. And this anticipatory theta activity has been shown to predict the degree to which the information will actually be subsequently uh, recalled. And importantly, it's been shown to be modulated by participants' motivation to learn. So if they were interested or if um, they were expecting a reward for um, encoding the information, um, the, a larger amount of theta oscillations was observed in anticipation of, these, um, of the information. So combined, the, the, these adult studies uh, suggest that when adults can expect to receive information and are motivated to encode it, this intent seems to be reflected in theta oscillations, um, which is then predictive of um, whether, which leads to superior learning, basically. So uh, we wanted to first establish whether um, this relationship between theta oscillations and learning also exists in infants. So what we did was, um, a task in which infants were free to explore novel objects while we continuously record their EEG activity. And after exploring all of the eight objects we gave them, infants were then presented with an image of the object they have played with, paired with another one that was very similar but just slightly different, so different in one feature. So they saw pairs of these objects at the time, one of which they have explored, and the other one is a new one. Um, and what we observed is, um, their looking time preferences um, to these two objects. So this is a standard approach in infant research, and the logic behind it is that if infants have encoded the features of the object they have played with, then they should notice that the other one is different, so that it's novel. Um, whereas, and they should have a looking time preference, either to the novel or the familiar one. Um, whereas if they don't remember what the object they have played with looks like, then we would predict 50-50 looking time. So we wanted to look at is whether the, the theta activity during the exploration would predict which of the objects they would remember at test. And this is the results. So um, the theta activity recorded over the frontal lobe while infants were playing with the objects freely predicted which of the objects they were in fact um, recognizing at tests as normal. Um, okay, so now that we have established that theta activity is predictive of learning in um, infants as it is in adults, we now want to use this measure and explore um, what is happening in infants' social selectivity. So just to give you a bit of background on the literature on um, infant social selectivity, so many studies show that infants are basically judicious and selective about who they interact with. 
For example, we know the things like whether or not someone's gazing directly at them, speaking infant directed speech, whether someone is competent or not, a reliable informant, influences the degree to which infants will tend to disperse and follow their gaze, uh, imitate their actions, and so on. And we know from another branch of research that um, another set of characteristics influences the same behavior, and that is whether or not um, agents are of the, speak the same language or of the same race as infants, whereby infants prefer to interact with people who could be defined as um, so-called in-groups, so um, native speakers in race. And while this first set of behavioral um, biases has been suggested to potentially serve a function of infants attending to uh, potential teachers, the second set of biases has largely been explained in terms of infants dividing the social world into, into groups and guiding their behavior according to some sort of principle of in-group loyalty or affiliation um, motives. So what we wanted to propose instead is that perhaps um, these behavioral preferences the infants show for in-group um, members may be guided by the same mechanisms as what we see in the other um, selectivity, namely that maybe all of these preferences are best explained by infants' motivation to obtain information from the optimal teachers in the environment. So we wanted to ask whether infants indeed perceive native speakers as superior sources of information, which would provide a plausible explanation for their behavioral preferences. And um, so what we studied is whether their social preferences are associated with um, theta oscillations, basically. So we have already shown that theta predicts learning in infants as it does in adults. But in the study that I have shown, um, the theta was recorded while the infants were already learning, so while they were obtaining information. But what the most interesting part in adult re research is that um, theta was evident before information was in fact presented to the adults. And since this anticipatory um, activation was modulated by whether or not adults were motivated to learn, it implies that some sort, it, theta could reflect some sort of selective preparatory state um, when, when information uh, should be encoded. And this is a state that perhaps infants are in when they point to something and wait for the information to their request. But if we want to explore whether social selectivity is driven by whom infants can expect information from, then we first need to show that we can indeed show theta oscillations in anticipation of information, not just during encoding, and that it is selective based on whether information can be expected or not. So that's what we did first. So we explored an, um, anticipated theta oscillations by introducing infants to two speakers. Um, one was informative and the other one was not. And the timeline of the trial was um, start with a baseline and then the person appeared, smiled at the infant and shifted the gaze to the object in front of her. Then nothing happened for two seconds, so she would just look at the object silently and still. And then finally, uh, this would be followed by an outcome period during which in the informative trials, the person would provide information about the object. The non-informative trials were identical with the exception that in the outcome period, there was no information to be gained. Um, in the first two conditions that we uh, manipulated, the information the infants could expect was uh, either labels for the objects, so the informative would name the object in front of them, the non-informative would just point and say, hmm. And um, in the other condition, the informative would pick up the object and demonstrate its function, whereas the non-informative would just pick it up and look at it. So the period of interest is the, the anticipation period where nothing is happening on the screen. And the only difference between the two conditions is the infant's expectation, whether or not they can expect to learn something new at the end of the trial. Um, so is, if theta oscillations reflect information expectation in infants, we should see a modulation of this rhythm depending on whether infants can expect information or not. And that is indeed what we find. So um, recorded over the a cluster of electrodes over the frontal lobe and bilateral temporal, we get an effect of the activity in theta frequency band um, which is sort of increased from baseline for the informative, but not for the non-informative um, trials. So the, this is good proof that 
theta oscillation can be used, um, can be observed in anticipation of information and is modulated by the potential of the social partner to convey information. And so we can now use this measure to ask whether infants perceive native speakers as superior sources of information over non-native speakers. So we ran the same study again, only um, that the outcome period, the informative person was naming objects in native language and the non-informative was naming them in their foreign languages, Spanish. Um, so again, if infants expect information from native speakers, uh, but not for foreign, which could explain their, why they show these behavioral preferences for native speakers, then we should see the same pattern of activation um, for theta as for native as we do for informative and the other end. And this is indeed what we find. So the, the pattern of activation is identical uh, when we look at the native speakers in comparison to the informants and the non-native to the non-informants. So, um, oh yeah, so we also looked at pupil dilation, uh, which is another measure of sort of heightened attention arousal, just to sort of cross-validate this method and we get an effect in pupil dilation as well. Um, so our results suggest that the infants indeed treated the native speakers um, in the same way as did uh, an informative person and a foreign person as a non-informative. And while this is strong evidence that suggests the infants can select the optimal sources of information and provide an alternative interpretation for their behavioral preferences, it remains unclear what, why exactly they do this or what are the mechanisms. So one could still argue that infants use this language cue to identify the members of their own group and then prefer to learn the information they get from them because either they find it more relevant or again for some sort of affiliative motives. Alternatively, it's possible that what infants primarily attend to is who they can learn from and potentially don't even encode native as in-group or foreign as out-group, but base the learning strategies on attending to teachers that offer information that is understandable, easier to embed in the knowledge they already have and therefore offers better learning progress. So in other words, if infant discrimination between native and foreign speakers is driven solely by information gain, then this preference should be absent if both native and foreign speakers offer information that infants can encode. So we tried to test this in another study, which um, basically we established a native and foreign contrast in a separate phase. So in a familiarization phase, the informants were labeling familiar objects in their respective languages. But then in the test phase, the information the infants could expect was in fact non-verbal functional demonstrations of the object. So in this case, there's no reason why one information, if the, the difference we observed before is driven by information gain, then there shouldn't be a difference here because both of the information is equally learnable uh, because it's non-verbal. If it's some sort of group dynamics, then we should still expect a difference. And again, we're looking at the anticipation period. Um, so what we find is indeed that once intelligible information is offered by both native and foreign speakers, infants no longer show this selective preparation to learn from either of the speakers and show an increase in theta rhythms uh, in expectation of information from both. Um, so from the study so far, we can conclude that at least two of the infants' behavior that we've looked at, namely pointing and selectivity in social partners, could be best explained by the infant's drive to obtain information from the best available source. And this suggests that the infants are indeed actively involved in this transmission of knowledge in interactions with others. Um, so to conclude with, I would like to go back to um, pointing and mention some of the unpublished findings and relate them to what we've discussed um, in this workshop previously, namely the potential positive loop um, feedback loop of um, curiosity. So that experience, experiencing and satisfying curiosity may in fact lead to more curiosity and therefore more knowledge um, acquisition, which I think is an important question from a developmental point of view. Um, so in the introduction, I mentioned that many studies have demonstrated both adults and infants are um, <coughs> develop specific abilities to, for fast and accurate transmission of knowledge. 
adults, ad adults adapt their communication when they communicate with infants and try to teach them information. And infants are s sensitive to these cues and um, attend and learn from, uh, from them when they're taught. And this process of, um, enables fast transmission of knowledge. Um, but what our studies have suggested that adults provision of information is not necessarily sufficient for the infant to learn. Um, and it, it's not just the adults that decide what um, the infant will learn. So if the infant requests information, it needs to be that information. It doesn't help if you teach them something else. So um, I wanted to argue that infants clearly uh, modulate their own social learning by information seeking and by attending to um, social partners selectively. Um, and most importantly, we've shown that responding to these requests and being a predictive good informant um, affects what infants will in fact learn. So, but these findings also imply that the extent to which infants will learn in everyday life uh, may request the ability of the caregivers to detect these um, behaviors, these states of interest, and appropriately respond to them. And in one of our pointing studies, we also um, recorded infants just freely interacting with parents in a sort of decorated room. And we measured how, um, how much infants spontaneously expressed um, these sort of information seeking behaviors, namely <coughs> pointing. And we found huge variability. So this is 18 infants over the course of five minutes, I believe. And you can see that the frequency of pointing varied anything from nearly 30 to practically zero. And if we look at adults' responses, so how many of these uh, gestures were in fact responded to with, with information, we can see there's variability there as well. So it's largely correlated, but we also have some relationships where infants point a lot and adults don't respond at all, and others that are almost one-to-one -one matching. So obviously this was a one-time um, a measurement at one point in time, so we can't infer any causation or anything. And, um, but because we know that in other studies that infants stop pointing if they don't achieve the, the desired response, um, it's very plausible that if their requests are ignored on a daily basis, this behavior might extinguish. And we don't know whether it, uh, this is uh, a behavior expression that is modulated by parents' response, or in fact their information-seeking drive itself. Um, but that way, all these studies suggest that nurturing infants' interest from early on with informative responses may be crucial not just because it affects their learning in that specific moment, but because it might affect uh, the amount of how much infants continue to request information and whether they develop this curious mind that we know is predictive of academic success. And with that, I'd like to thank my supervisors. And thank you. Can I first say thank you for getting us almost back on time? Thank you. Yes. Did you look at the microphone? Yeah. Okay, so it's on. Okay, okay. So I think that this um, anticipatory orienting, which is very, very smart, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to predict expected information gain, is a v um, very, very fundamental, and to behaviors maybe broader than you might that go way beyond pointing yep. to behaviors that have to do with deploying your attention in a crowded environment, right? So the ability to deploy attention to informative parts of the environment, we use it in every day, you know, on a millisecond basis. Yeah. And so, uh, and as you know, theta oscillations are very strongly related with attentional control, right? The, uh, it's the exact. Okay, so my question is, if you have thought about doing this, or if it's possible to do, in a context in which there are two sources of information, so an informative one and an uninformative one, because that's a, a real problem <coughs> in real environments. You have to you know, select your inform information source. And so can you think about doing this? That would be I am, in amazing. fact, right now what? trying yeah. to do that, yes. So it's possible to record lateralized theta 
No, um, so in the paradigm that I'm looking at, we're looking at um, an eye-tracking um, woman. So who do they look at preferentially when they're faced with novel information after they have been trained, which is a good or the bad source right. of information? Right. So I think with Theta, I, I, I think the problem with at least how we've had designed so far is that you need quite a lot of time for the theta to build up, and especially with the frontal theta, it might be problematic if there's a lot of eye movements. So, I mean, I can think about how, how the neural measures could be implemented as well, but we are looking at whether they actually choose between the two, the two sources of information selectively, right. as opposed to just prepare for to one. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. we should talk. Thanks for a great talk. So, I'm fighting with a notion that they are good informants and bad informants. Um, and partly it's because I've been working a lot with bilingual um, people, but also a lot with deaf kids. And um, there's a notion in bilingualism that uh, you need to attune your register. Um, and you your register. So if in deaf population, <coughs> profoundly deaf population, they get a degraded input, vocal input for most of us because we sort of down like our English, we slow down, we give them really bad. But for those of us that also sign, that means that we give them really bad signing because we are not native speakers. Uh -huh. um, and so you get very different results depending on whether when you get the participants in the lab you use one language or another, but even you use as an experimenter a native person from their language or not. And I suspect that there's two sources, of, like several sources of information here, but there's a prior knowledge of your kids. Maybe a lot of them were actually monolingual. I don't know, yes, but yes. I don't know whether they checked for I that haven't or not. Checked. I haven't mentioned, but yes, they were all monolingual, yeah. But there's also um, the... Um, expectation then after that of the context of the lab. For example, I can give you an example from real life. I had twins, I had a bunch of friends at home, they were all signing, we were all signing. After they were a year and a half, they spent two hours absolutely speechless, they didn't move, they watched everybody. Like There was something where they understood that something totally different was happening and it was a time to learn and to better catch up because they were going to be totally lost. That would be a bad informer for you because it was a totally different language and nothing to do with what they had seen before. <laughs> and so that's why obviously like, a bad informer can be also a source of novelty that is really important and that you better learn because otherwise you're going to be left behind. And so I'm, I'm not no. sure how you think about these things. I absolutely agree with you. So I think it's really important to, to emphasize the fact that this is an experimental situation and we always give them a choice of two very clearly distinguishable informants. So I don't think that babies would never be willing to, to learn from, from someone who speaks their native language or that if they were exposed to like sign language or everyone speaking foreign that they would just shut off and not learn ever again. In fact, I think the fact that they have a choice um, and that there's this clear distinction is, is important in, in what we see here. So we wanted to test whether at all, they do the discriminate between between this kind of, and we can see use these neural measures. But I agree that in if they are exposed to just novelty, they would still learn something, and that this is not. And so it begs the question of when do they go for novelty versus when do they go for what we call the good informer? Yes. So I think it's. I mean, I would I would refer to this optimal learning progress. So the potential of actually, I think, if you're offered new labels for objects that you've never seen before, one embedded in a, in a sentence that you can at least parse out to, to words and identify what the new word is and attach it, versus one that is just a stream of sounds that you don't understand. And of course, the potential for learning is much greater in the, in the native speaker, right? Because you can understand it. Um, so I think that is a crucial element here, whereas if if all information is equal, like we saw in the last condition, they're happy to learn from, from anyone and anything. And I don't necessarily think this is a, I mean, how they identify native speakers, it could be some sort of familiarity bias, so they recognize them as similar to teachers that they have previously encountered. Um, but it's true that I'm sure that there are contexts in which if all information is already known, for example, then why not attend to the new person speaking a different language because maybe that's where you can learn something, whereas this one's already only telling me things I already know. But yeah. So, 
S sorry. Thank the, you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Don't you have a... So, um, so thank you. It was very, very elegant studies. Um, I was just wondering about one thing, which is, I mean, I, I cannot stop wondering what is this theta uh, band meaning, and, 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 and why do you get it? Here? Why do you get it here? And I was wondering whether there was not a possible confound, actually, by the fact that the informant, uh, the, the one that has the information, is the one for which you have a lot of memory from what happened before. So basically, it's always the same agent which has some information. And it might be that during the expectation period, when you see that informant, you're simply remembering what happened after, uh, b b uh, before. So in the case uh, of the theta band, what you would get, of course, is that you would get an increase in theta band in the expectation period whenever you see the person which has been informative before compared to the person which hasn't been informative before. So maybe, maybe this neuromarker is not a neuromarker of you um, expecting the person to tell you something important, but maybe what's happening in the baby's head is simply that whenever he sees the informative agent, he's simply remembering everything that happened before. Because when you look at the theta uh, marker used in adults, it's, it's used as a marker of memory and uh, working memory. As you show, there's like strong connections between the prefrontal cortex and the uh, hippocampus in your, in your, um, in your slides. And yeah, so, so I was wondering what you uh, think about that and the possibility that the theta is simply uh, reflecting some previous memories which are of course stronger in the informative agent compared to the info uninformative agent. And this okay. might also explain the last experiment where when you have a foreign person versus a new uh, person with your native language, uh, when they're both informant, uh, informative, sorry, then you get the same amount of, uh, of, of theta, more or less. I'm not sure I understand what the distinction is. So, I mean, I think, of course, they need to remember the two different informants, otherwise we wouldn't get uh, the, the selective theta activation. But I don't see why they would remember the informative better than the non-informative. Be um, because the informative gave them a lot of labels every time during the previous trials. And the, the inform non-informative interacted with objects just as much, just didn't give them the labels. Okay, but the, he, he didn't give any, I mean, he's not informative by the mere fact that he didn't give information. Yes, but that's the, the point. I'm not I mean, sure we, I understand, we, we, sorry. We can discuss it later, okay. but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. any, any, any more questions before I invite? One there and then Jackie, is that okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry. Maybe just a brief comment to the uh, data oscillations as well. So it has been shown in in adults basically as well. If Sorry. you ju oh, just to the theta oscillation um, comment, so in adults as well, it has been shown that only if there's a fixation <coughs> cross, if there's no expectancy <coughs> whatsoever, what might come next, the theta oscillations might also predict memory later memory performance. So if it's completely also with neural with um, neural feedback, for example, as well, if you happen to show a stimulus just in the state of high theta oscillations that facilitates memory as well. And it doesn't speak to, um, to your study. There's been some, some findings. Um, yeah, just one quick question about um, the first study um, where you basically showed that choice facilitated learning. Um, the pointing study? Yeah, the, yeah, exactly, the first one. Um, I think that's also quite compatible with um, studies in adults where they show that choice really benefits yes. memory, yes. like studies by um, Deepu, Vishnumurti. And you think that might be the, the crucial difference between why we don't find incidental learning? Yeah, that's uh, that was my question. Yeah, if, if you think it might be more like the paradigm, that the paradigm might be different, or if you think there's really a fundamental difference, di different mechanisms, how, how infants learn. I mean, like, if, I, would be if I can answer with, with a question, do you think yeah. that if you <laughs> had other than faces as the inf incidental information, they, you would still get an effect? Yeah, yeah, that could be, that yeah. could be the case. I mean, I think the task in our case is very ta 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 taxing for infants. Yeah. So there's a lot of functions and a lot of new things. So the learning rates are, in fact, very low. Um, and I think it's possible that we're just reaching the limits of their ability. So it could be that we find this incidental learning if information is easier to encode, say if we have faces, for example. Um, and I don't know whether this is just a cognitive load issue or 
the timing or, in fact, different mechanisms. I, I don't know, but it's interesting. To yeah, yeah, maybe you could use the, the paradigm, basically, with uh, informative versus non-informative from the EEG study and see during the yeah, anticipation exactly. period. Yeah. If you have a true anticipation period, yeah. do they, do infants remember the color of the sweater better yeah, than the yeah. informative person? No, it would be definitely interesting to look at, yeah. One last short, quick question. All right. Short, quick answer. All right. Um, so it's mostly a comment. So going back to Daphne's uh, question, <coughs> I just wanted to point out that it's not a matter of attending to informative sources versus attending to unknown things. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we have two systems, and I think your paradigm clearly shows that they operate at the same time because the infant is, look, is finding the informative source while pointing to something he doesn't know. So there are two attentional systems, and sometimes in the attentional literature, this is called attention for learning versus attention for action. I think right. we really don't know the neural substrates, but it's really clear from behavior that we have these two op apparently opposite drives, and somehow they, uh, we can beautifully regulate our attentional control mm. and use them in different ways. So. That's a great point, thanks. Yeah. Okay, that's a great start. Great conversation.